Hello, Jamie. How are you today? Hey, guys. Yeah, good. So uh, a little bit about me, the brief synopsis, uh, so to speak. Um, grew up in England uh, for 28 years. Uh, my father bought me a BMX bike at 10 years old. And uh, with the BMX bike, I, I got a sense of freedom. Uh, it was my first real mode of transportation. And living in a small town in the Midlands, a lot of my friends all had BMX bikes too. So a friendship group that was already strong was now, you know, given a new lease of life to, to go explore, to ride these new bikes that nobody had ever seen before, um, to have fun with accessorizing the bikes. And to really find our feet in something that wasn't team oriented. It, it wasn't football, it wasn't basketball, it wasn't you know part of a, a rugby team. It was something that was an individual sport, um, an individual hobby, and it allowed your creativity to come through. So at the age of 10, I got a bike. And from there on out, I started to explore BMX even more. I found a local BMX club that enabled me to ride different kinds of things that the BMX track didn't offer. And it really introduced me to the sport of freestyle BMX. And from then on, I basically went around the contest scene. Uh, I cut. Uh, I found my love of competitions, and that's where it all started. I went from competition to competition uh, throughout England, then started traveling to Europe on a regular basis at the weekends, which was a lot of fun. And I just found that the, the BMX Freestyle gave me an opportunity to not only travel around England to meet like-minded people and make friends, but also into Europe as well. Uh, with the travel, um, with the exposure to different BMX uh, regions, uh, I just started getting really good, and I started to enjoy <laughs> it more. And that led me to international travel to the Americas. And... It really, you know, it, it really just, it, it really has a, a huge place in my heart. And, you know, so does competition. And from there on out, I basically went from being a 16-year-old guy that left school and went to the working world until he was 28. And at 28, I got my first real sponsor. And at 28, I went to America to, to discover, you know, the, the land of opportunity and the competition scene in America, which was where the best in the world all came from. And, you know, that's where life 2.0 in BMX started. I had progressed from England into America and really wanted to see how far not only I could take BMX, but myself. And I wow. always had a strong work ethic, but I didn't realize that with that work ethic, if I applied it to something else in my life, yeah. it would generate into, you know, an incredible amount of success. Okay. So, yeah, and here we are today. And... Sorry. Um, right. Here we are today, and I'm living in the United States of America. I've been living here for 22 years. Uh, not only have I progressed to the very top of my sport, but I've also progressed into coaching the Olympic team for the UK. And I work alongside the, the greatest action sports camp in, in the history of action sports, which is Woodward Camp. So, yeah, um, from a small town in England at 10 years old, <laughs> I seem to have uh, 
You've done all right. Taking it all the way. <laughs> um, so what? What? Let's take it back a little bit. What was the first? Tell us how it felt when you first won your first competition, and how how did that motivate you to keep going? Because I'm I'm pretty sure you probably wasn't earning a lot of money at the time, so it wasn't as if okay, this could actually this could actually set me up and allow me to earn money from something that I actually love doing. Uh, I never did BMX for the money. I, I still don't. The the money, you know, has just become a byproduct of becoming a professional rider. When I was in England, I, I never meant, I never earned a penny from BMX. Uh, I did it because I purely loved BMX. I can't remember the first time I won a competition. It was probably um, as a teenager, and I was a part of the UK uh, BFA scene, which was the UK BMX Federation. Um, and I, I, I think I can remember the excitement of entering my first competition more than I can win in the competition. <laughs> it, BMXs were an opportunity to not only show off the bike that you had, but also to show off your creative side too. It's a very showy sport. It's based on, you know, artistic capabilities and and guts and grit and progression. And I can only remember the first time my mom took me to the competition, which was in the next town over from where we lived. And... I knew it just it lit me up so much. And even though I came dead last, it didn't matter. I just enjoyed being out there, not a part of a team, but having to do this uh, this sport on my own and and to find a way of impressing the judges and also find a way of... Uh, enjoying the moment because it, it was quite nerve wracking. Um, and I really did enjoy the moment and that's what stuck with me more than my first win. Um, I would imagine yeah. my first win came when I was around 16, 17. Um, but the, the moment I got to ride out at my first competition was just, that was just so special. I'd never done anything like it before. And it, it took a lot of uh, guts to ride out there in front of a, a large group of people and and to do something you'd, you'd never really done or experienced before. So that was a cool moment. Yeah, Jamie, I remember, I, I remember those days. Um, I was from north of the border, but we're of a similar vintage. So, like you, I remember the arrival of the, uh, the BMX on the scene uh, quite a formative age and uh, everything that you've outlined there sort of echoes a very similar experience in terms of a, a part of a bonding process with with your mates at a, a very important stage of life what sort of competition was the first one that you entered was it a race it or was what? it more freestyle no it was freestyle. I, it was. I was never fast around the racetrack. Um, however, I could always jump the highest and the furthest at the BMX track mm. on the last tabletop jump. So that is what led me to freestyle. And while I was, you know, in awe of the racing pictures, it was purely from the accessories that the pro riders had on their bikes and the uniforms and the way they looked, they just looked so cool. However, when BMX freestyle started to make an impact, I felt the images were more visually spectacular. And it was something that really caught my attention and inspired me to, to try on the BMX track. And finding that first freestyle club was instrumental in in steering me towards the competitions 
And yeah, the first competition I ever entered was a regional competition. So it was only for the local riders in, in uh, the Midlands. And then regional competitions led me to national competitions, national to international, and so on and so forth. But it, it really was a good introduction uh, into BMX freestyle. The, the regional competitions were was where all your friends were at too. And I would say it's fair to say that I was the worst BMXer in the town I lived in. And in fact, in, in a 10 mile radius, I was the worst BMX <laughs> rider. And unfortunately, my, all my friends found girls and cars and other things to occupy their time uh, when they reached the age of 16. And I still had my love for BMX and I continued it. And you know, it, it was tough to see guys with such talent in my area give up something that they love so easy, and I, I couldn't, I couldn't give it up. It, it, right. it, it was my, it was still my freedom. It was still allowing me to be creative and to, to uh, you know, aspire to perform the tricks that I'd seen in the magazines and. I couldn't do that in a car or in a pub or, you know, anything like that. So, you know, I really, I still wanted BMX in my life because while my, my work in life and I worked as a ceramic tiler for six years, uh, while that was, was fun, it was just a means to an end to provide me with the funding in order to pay for petrol, in order to buy my spares for the bikes and um, in order to live out my my BMX life, so yeah, the uh, the first contests were competitive. However, they were it was a very local oriented competition. Nice, yeah. I, I think it's it's that combination of it both being very much a a technical endeavour and a form of artistic expression that does make it very beautiful and that's where the tenacity really shows because ultimately probably the vast majority of your time is failing before it comes good I would have thought yeah. in terms of time spent um, and I guess any artist can identify with that you know it's uh, it's after long endeavours that they actually feel some may never feel happy with their work. Yeah. 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 And I yeah. think, uh, and I think as I would, well, I would, uh, I would say, I would say fa failure walks, you know, it, it walks hand in hand with success. It, it has to, you know, nobody starts out by pulling the trick first go. You know, you, you, you have to understand the fundamentals of BMX and, and how it all correlates to, to what you're trying to achieve. And, that is the fun part of um, of BMX is the failure. You know, without it, if it was too easy, everybody would, you know, everybody would be the best in the world and be able to do every trick. Um, so I enjoy that part. I enjoy the process. I enjoy having to work for something and the reward that it brings me at the end of it when I find that success. And that has definitely helped shape my work ethic, my career over the years, and the way that I coach not only the Olympic team, but also any rider that comes through Woodward Camp and any you know new kid getting into it, and even my son. Um, I just, you know, help him with, you know, with the fact that failure is part of uh, success. Yeah, it's, uh, it's I, I think perhaps the way that I would perhaps relate to it is this process of discovery. In a sense, you can try and teach people what it's all about, but ultimately what you're doing is creating a framework for them to discover it themselves. And that's how, that's perhaps when it sticks and when it's, 
when it's been learned? Yeah, hundred percent. Um, you know, while small adjustments can be made from a coaching aspect, um, the the trial and error is is upon the rider, and you know they they really have to find out for themselves a way in order to you know, start making the small success in whatever they're trying to to master. Whether that's the trick, whether it's a competition, whatever it is involved with the, the BMX bike, they they have to explore all those those avenues. Uh, they have to make the failures and they have to uh, you know understand that it's the process but it's a process whereas if you keep making those same mistakes you're never going to get any further uh to the goal and you know you 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 have to understand that you know and you 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 have to you have to work hard at not making the same mistake twice Mm -hmm. and that is uh that i mean that can apply to anything in life but especially BMX riding because of uh, the stakes uh, in place when you are riding and performing uh, at a a beginner's level or the highest level in the world. And how, how, how have you been able to maintain that boyish enthusiasm? What would you say to your riders who you want them to be motivated and know that if they trust the process, then good things can happen. How do you how how do you maintain that enthusiasm for the sport? I love BMX. <clears throat> I still love everything about it. I I love the opportunity to go out there and and still perform and to progress and to make the mistakes in order to gain the success. And I I tell all my riders if you don't love bmx bmx will never give you the love um it'll never give you the success that you're looking for and it will constantly remind you of the failures uh and the, and the lessons can be quite harsh so you have to learn to to love what you do um otherwise why do it you know are you doing it you know for another ma- reason is it financial? Is it for fame? Is it, yeah. Fame? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, what is it? At the end of the day, fame's fickle. It really is. You can be famous for five minutes and then you can fall off yeah. the face of the earth. Yeah, for but sure. BMX bikes uh, can give you so much, so much. They, they can allow you to explore. They can build friendship bases. They can help you progress as a human being. They can teach you valuable life lessons. And they can open doors to a world that you never thought was was there. And it, it's a world of endless possibilities. Wow. So you go to America at the age of 28. How long did it take for you to win your first X Games? Uh, I won it in what two thousand. So, and you was you was a uh, runner up the year before that, right? No, no, I couldn't. I couldn't. Uh, in nineteen ninety six, I got my first X Games medal, which was a bronze. Um, and then in ninety seven, I didn't really do anything. Ninety eight, I didn't do anything. Ninety nine, I crashed. I think I got seventh place. And then in the year 2000, uh, I finally won. I think I was around, what? I think I was actually 28 when I won my first X Games medal, which is quite late in the day uh, for a lot of riders. Um, However, up until that point, I'd never had an opportunity to live out my dream of becoming a professional BMX rider. I worked from... From the age of 16 till, shoot, 
Um, no, it must, I must have been 29 because I worked until I was 28 years old. So I always had a job uh, six wow. days a week um, just to fund my BMX riding. And it wasn't until I was uh, 28 that I was given an opportunity to ride bikes uh, for a, a big bicycle company in America. And I seized the opportunity and it enabled me to leave my place of work in order to pursue a dream of becoming a professional BMX rider. Um, so, yeah, uh, I was probably around 29 on the cusp of being 30, uh, which is, like I say, it's a little older um, for most X Games winners these days. Uh, however, the X Games was in its infancy and it had really not been around for, for that long. So the X Games was, was starting to build up a lot of steam and a lot of popularity. And that was actually perfect timing for me to leave work and become a professional BMX rider. How was, how, how did you feel when you were standing on the first place podium the first time? Uh, how did I feel? I mean, it was a dream come true. And the, it was just a very emotional day. I can remember everybody who I wanted to be there was there. Wow. Uh, a lot of my really good friends who would become my team managers, um, my wife, you know, just the, the right people were at the side of the ramp. And what they saw that day was the, all the failures I went through in BMX finally turned into success because I stopped making the same mistakes twice. And I realized that in order to become a champion, I had to develop a work ethic and a mindset of a champion. And that change allowed me to take the t top step of the podium. Without that, I still would have na never made the podium. Um, it's a conscious decision that any athlete that wants to be the best in the world has to make. And that is literally what separates uh first from second third and so on and so you know and all the way down so, so yeah it was, this uh, is it was an incredible almost, day an affirmation that all those leaps of faith by in the past were the right things to do it was just the culmination of the the dream the, the dream right. was always to be the best in the world and to take myself my progression and the progression of the sport to new heights and on that day I did it so what 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 was it that did you feel it as it was happening did you know okay I'm 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 where I need to be right now to actually be able to win this or was it just happy stance no I was incredibly confident in my abilities I had practice um you know, for, for weeks leading up to the event, uh, it was the right practice. I had a personal trainer helping me with fitness uh, at a time where personal trainers weren't even a thing. And oh, wow. it's that confidence that allowed me to to be a champion. I was uh, I, I wouldn't think about anything else other than how a champion thinks. I would gain inspiration from other champions and... I, I took that mindset into the event and with, you know, progression, determination, positivity, and uh, a, a strong will and drive to, to bring this over the line. You know, that was, that was the first uh, X Games medal that uh, I, you know, I won. So it definitely meant the most. Mm. that's amazing so with, with with the fact that you've just said that you had a personal trainer so i'm guessing he was working with you on strength and conditioning to make sure that you can actually have the level of fitness to actually perform those stunts um what made you 
take that route when other people wasn't weren't doing that? Well, the reason I got a personal trainer was if you want to be the best in the world, you have to be the best in the world on all accounts. You have to be the best in the world from a mindset perspective, from a physical perspective, and from a riding and progression perspective. Without all those key elements, you're just a competitor. And I didn't want to be a competitor anymore. I wanted to be the best in the world. And I had to adopt the same mindset as the best in the world. And that is why I built a team around me that would support my vision and my goals and my dream. Within BMS at the time, was that quite progressive thinking to build a rounded team of people around you? I mean, quite possibly, yeah. Um, I, I think the, the guy who was at the top of the sport, which was Dave Mirror at the time, was an, an, an incredible athlete in his own right, and he was very driven, and he was the champion. He was the, the king of the X Games, so to speak. So in order to dethrone the guy who was one of the winningest athletes in the history of BMX, I had to take myself above and beyond what he was doing. And that was the only way you can not only be competitive against the best guy in the world, but you can progress further than he could. Um, And it it takes uh, a lot of drive, a lot of sacrifice. Things have to fall by the wayside. you know, being English, um, there's definitely uh, an English mentality to to training, to lifestyle and to attitude. And I had to leave everything by the wayside and start to think in a very different way and something that was supportive of, of my goal of, of becoming the champion. So sacrifices had to be made along the way to greatness. 100%. Every every great athlete in the world, um, past or present, will will tell you that whether it's from their mouth in an interview or an autobiography or you know in the uh, the pages of history. So is there is there also a level of visualiz- visualization when you're do you visualize do you visualize yourself winning? Do you visualize yourself on the top of the podium? Is there a little bit of that in there as well? A hundred percent. If, you know, how can I make it come true if I don't see myself on top of the podium, if I, if I don't see myself as a winner? So you, so you win the first X Games and then you essentially go on to basically dominate that event for years to come. How, I'm, I'm always um, interested to find out how, I know you love BMX, but how do you continually keep maintaining that level of enthusiasm and love for the sport to keep winning? Does it become more about winning or is it just your love for the sport? Um, well, I guess I would just backtrack a little bit. The, the From 2000 with the first win, the the road became a little rockier, so to speak. Um, I found success. I also found failure. Um, I missed two X Games in a row due to injuries. Um, I came back in 2003 to win, lost in 2004, and then won in 2005 and lost in 2006. And then basically, again, came to another juncture in the road and decided that I literally needed to step up another level in order to beat the next generation of riders. Um, But, you know, in answer to your question about how do you stay enthusiastic about it? You know, like, like I said before, I, I love BMX. How can I not be enthusiastic about it? Whenever I see anything that has been done in the past or, or something that the new generation is doing through social media, I get excited about it. I get excited about building a new bike for myself, picking out a new color, wow. 
trying new parts. I, I love bikes. At the end of the day, you know, I love bikes. It's, you know, BMX has become my life partner. Um, and I, I think about it every day. I look at my bikes. I think of new tricks. I think of new ways to give athletes advice. And I look forward to, to traveling to the events and watching the best in the world compete. Um, I literally, I, I do, I, I love BMX and that will never leave me. <laughs> that will never leave because you. Because it gave me that opportunity and it, it gave me direction in my life at a time where I had no direction and I had no enthusiasm for team sports. And I right. needed something that I could make my own and allow me to develop a side of myself that wasn't in line with the normal. And the normal at the time was get a job, go to work, go out with your friends at the weekend, and then repeat. And right. BMX just gave me that escape. Every night when I got back from work, I would leave work, you know, at the door, grab my BMX bike, and then I would go to a different world, a world that excited me, a world that allowed me to be creative, and a world to build everlasting friendships. And I, uh, I only even bring that up because I when I'm watching a lot of uh, sports press, sports personalities or sportsmen and women it seems like their love for the sport deteriorates as they rise through the ranks so the politics and the different mechanics of the actual sport or could actually make them fall out of love with it so it's really interesting to see how you've been able to maintain your love for it yeah, I, I could, I can definitely see that, and I've often seen friends fall by the wayside, or, or the best riders in the world fall by the wayside because they lost the passion <clears throat> for what they did. Uh, for me, it, it never left. You know, there, there were times where I got tired and, and burnt out, um, and in that instance, it's it, it's time to take a break. It, it's time to reset. It's time to allow your body to heal allow your mind to heal. But upon return to the bike, the enthusiasm comes right back. It, it's, it's that love. At, at the end of the day, any relationship you have in life is always going to have its peaks and valleys. But you ride it out. You, you stay the course because you know that underlying everything is love for what you do. All right, so you trust the process in order to. So you on this. So where did you develop no, there, that there level of honesty? No, more than that. There, there is no process. I I love BMX. From the first time my dad gave me a yeah. BMX bike at ten, that was it. I, I love it. Mm. the The process becomes part of your life when you're uh, you you start to lead a competitive life, and and that is something that's required if you want to be the best in the world. But when I wasn't at competitions, I would just ride my ramp and I would ride every day because I loved it. And it wasn't a process. It wasn't a chore. It was something that I wanted to do. It was in support of my goal. And whether I was training for the X Games or riding in front of half a dozen kids at Woodward Camp or riding the skate park with my friends or the trails. It was only ever love for the bike. Uh, that's all I wanted to do because it brought me so much happiness. It, the process never became a part until, you know, the competitive years and the, and the, the wanting to fulfill my lifelong goal of being a champion came into play. Wow. Does it still lift your heart when you see kids building ramps on street corners? 
Uh, pulling you, himself you off. And... Many, yeah, you don't see many <laughs> kids building ramps on street corners these days. There's uh, no. there's a lot of great places to ride around the world. That's probably true. Um, yeah. You know, um, so I think that era of life has come and gone. Uh, sadly, it's been replaced by phones. Yep. Uh, which is a shame. You know, in, in, when I was 10, you know, if you wanted to know where everybody was, you would ride around until you found all the bikes on someone's lawn or propped up against somebody's house. Right. That that was how you find out. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and then yeah. that's where, you know, you would gather everybody together and go off on an adventure. These days it's all done through phones and that level of distraction has veered a lot of kids away from participating in sports. And when you mm. can class a video game as a sport, that to me is, uh, while it, there is a certain amount of practice that goes into it, uh, you, you're sat in a chair twiddling your fingers, <laughs> looking at a TV screen, and exactly. there is no real physical element to it. So to me, that's not really a sport. That's just... You know, that's a waste to of me, time. To me, it's more of a, yeah, I wouldn't call it a sport. I wouldn't call it, I'd, I'd call it more of a, a skill. Because I've, I've, I feel like the esports ice is really growing, but I don't personally get it because I'm all about, I like seeing when people do things that I know I can't do on a physical level. While with a video game, I know that with enough practice, I'll probably be able to do exactly what they've been able to do. Um, while with the physicality of sports, some people are just naturally more gifted or able to be able to do certain things. While with a video game, it's literally a matter of practice. Um, yes and no. Um, there, there are people more gifted than others, especially a video game seems to have a lot more hand-eye coordination. Um, but a lot, of, a lot of it is memory, a lot of it is strategy, you know, much like uh, any competition. However, there is no real physical demands other than staying awake for <laughs> an obscene amount of hours um, yeah. in order to play video games. Uh, but, you know, there is a, a big participant base. Uh, esports are growing. Esports were even at the X Games. And I think it's, you know, the gaming world is one of the biggest industries in the world, and quite rightly so. You know, they've tapped into an enormous uh, fan base. To me, the only, you know, the, the only benefits of, um, of video games are entertainment, in, in downtime and from a training perspective for, you know, for, for drivers and, you know, um, for anybody that needs to practice their skills away from a racetrack that, you know, doesn't allow them to be in the car every day uh, for hours on end. Uh, whether that's from a danger aspect or a financial aspect. So, you know, yeah, there, there are some benefits to, to video games, but I, I purely, me personally, I purely see them as, uh, as recreation. And even though they've made a very incredibly lucrative competition element to it, it I just I find them more for recreation than competitive. Do you do you remember is there has there ever been a moment for you where you just pinched yourself and said I can't believe I'm here? Every day. Every day I I walk in the house, I look at my bikes, uh I look at the life that I lead, I look at where I am, I look at the opportunities it gives me still to this day. And yeah, I I pinch myself because I could have said no, and I could have stayed working in England, and yeah. I could have succumbed to a life that is very different to what I have now. So I'm very thankful that 
I took that opportunity and I followed a dream. Regardless of how scary it was, I followed the dream and I, 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 I kept going until the dream became a reality. Did you, was there any, well, obviously there was probably moments where you thought, it, did, was there any moments where you thought it wasn't going to happen for you? No. <laughs> I get it. Because uh, every, every dream has its moments, you know, of, uh, there's always a, a rocky road in the dream. Nothing's ever smooth sailing, you know, and, and that's what makes for great stories, uh, mm. great books, um, inspirational, you know, speakers. They, they always had a path of hardship in order to get to their goal, to, to reach the heights of success that they always dreamed of. And without that hardship, they, they wouldn't appreciate what they have and they wouldn't be able to inspire because their story would be, you know, uninspiring. You know, the, the, the people that get inspired by the best athletes in the world appreciate the hardship they went through in order to achieve the, their goal, their success. That's, that, that's what inspires people, not, not some smooth sailing. Does the, the the coaching aspect of your life now provide satisfaction that perhaps you didn't get from competition? So could that. you repeat that? So yeah, does it, does the coaching aspect of your life now in your professional capacity does it provide any other form of um, satisfaction? that um, perhaps may not have been there in the earlier years of competing? No, it very much mimics, you know, my competitive life on a BMX bike. Anytime I can give a piece of advice or help a rider to achieve their goal, that's a win for me. It, it, it's, a, it's, a huge, it's a huge win for me. Um, their success, you know, I am a part of that. So, you know, it's, it's nothing I haven't experienced before, you know, to take a rider through the steps that is required in order to achieve the goal is very rewarding. And it's very rewarding when they get to the end and they achieve that level of success they're looking for. It, it's very satisfying and, and it means I was a part of their process and I can, you know, I can, uh, I can enjoy that moment too. And you, you, you attended the uh, last Olympics, right? In Japan. I did. Yes. Um, how was that experience? Uh, the experience from Japan was a little, little different. Yeah. Uh, no crowds. So it was a little different. And it was amazing too, because we were at the Olympics competing in a very different kind of year. And I felt it took a little bit of the pressure off the athletes because when you have 20,000 people in the stands and they're, they're, they're screaming out for, you know, you to go in and, and to perform, it can be a very, uh, it can be a very intimidating situation. Uh, what was presented to them was no crowds, uh, only, you know, the teams and the countries were there uh, with their support staffs. And while the contest itself was a very high pressure situation, it wasn't intensified by the addition of thousands of people. So yeah, it was, it was different, but in the same respect, it was, it was good. And it was uh, somewhat, if you can say this, a relaxed affair. <laughs> and um, how how amazing is it to see BMX be at the Olympics, considering where it's coming from and how relatively new it is compared to other sports? 
Well, BMX has been in the Olympics since 2008 with BMX racing. BMX freestyle was included for the first time in 2022 in Tokyo. So it's always been great to see BMX in the Olympics. I feel it is something that deserves to be there. The Olympics has become very tired with a lot of sports that are past their sell-by date and are out of tune with the youth of today and what the demands are from the viewers who uh, tune in to watch the Olympics. So BMX Freestyle was an enormous shot in the arm for the sporting event. And it was also what everybody at home wanted to watch. It became the absolute darling of the Olympic Games. And, and I feel it was the most spectacular part of the Olympic Games, hands down. I would agree. I agree. I would agree. Um, except the the 100 meters. I'm Jamaican, so 100 meters is like, that's the king sport for us. Um, for sure. Yeah. Every, everybody has their sport that they they resonate with um, and that they have athletes who they're invested with. Um, and there was a time in in my life where, yeah, uh, I was invested in track because we had some celebrity names out on the track that were pushing the progression and the times of of their sport. Um, unfortunately, those guys have fallen by the wayside now and moved on into different roles. And nothing moved on with the Olympics. Uh, while they got replaced by other people, they didn't have the allure that the that the guys before them had. I agree. And BMX freestyle brought in an element that is has been missing for a long time, and we're developing new names to add to the Olympics, new celebrities uh, that are more in tune with the youth of today and um, their demands. Yeah, and it all maintains the, the relevance of the games in the broader realms of society and what you were picking up on earlier about some activities having gone way past the sell-by date is pretty accurate. For sure, for sure, for sure, it's definitely. Yeah, sometimes I'm watching some of those sports and I'm just like, what? <laughs> what's happening? Well, I'm watching someone shooting and, and, and running across the forest and I'm just, it yeah. does nothing for me. And then the Winter Olympics is even worse. I'm not sure if anyone really watches that one. Oh, I don't know about that. I think the the viewership. snowboarding is incredibly I'm, popular. I'm, indeed, I'm quite keen on the <laughs> winter games. Uh, maybe I, I'm, I'm not much of a cold weather <laughs> sort of guy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so after your illustrious career, you've now entered into coaching. What else do you do now? What's, what's, what's your new passion? What's your new love? I know you have a coffee. Yeah, I have, a, I have a coffee business out in, in the United States. Um, I have taken up ultra endurance racing. So I okay. love racing over, you know, a lot of miles, whether that's, um, and, and it's mainly a gravel bike that I now race on. Um, I find the gravel community very, uh, very much like BMX. Uh, they're, they're very embracing. They're a lot of fun. The bikes are very accessible. Uh, the clothing, uh, while it's spandex, it's definitely fun. And, you know, it's just, it's just a good vibe. And everybody goes there with a different agenda. You know, the pros want to win. The, the rest of, of the participants either are you know, um, look into, I don't, I don't know, just to look into progress themselves. You know, some people have never ridden 30 miles, 50 miles, a hundred miles, 150, 200. So they train towards a goal and they train towards performing the impossible on the day against the elements. And that's really, really cool to see and inspiring. And, my reasons for going there are, are very different. I don't go there to win. 
I go there to participate, but I also go there to do my best. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going there just to ride around and, and, you know, just to do a disservice to myself. I still train as if I was competing at the highest level. And I go there with an attitude of being the best I can be on that day. And whatever that is, it'll be 100% of me. And where the, the cards fall is, is where they fall. But I enjoy gravel racing. It, it gives me a different perspective of, of the area that I'm riding in. And I get to ride with some absolutely phenomenal people, some great characters. And when I come back, uh, there's, always a, uh, there's always a celebration at the finish, which is very rewarding. Amazing. And you're riding on a Pinarello, right? I do. I ride, uh, I ride for Pinarello bikes and, um, our good partners. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. I guess it's, um, <laughs> you know, it's like riding for Ferrari or Ducati, Yeah, you know, yeah. you, you yeah, ride yeah, a yeah. Pinarello bike and it's, it's the Italian it's brand. Yeah, it, it is. It's a big deal for sure. It's a big deal for sure. I mean, we, yeah, it's definitely a big deal. We're very happy for them to be our partners as well. It's a, it's a, it's a lot of heritage within the brand, a lot of history. And for me, if I was riding and I had the, the talent like yourself, then I'd, that would even be a little bit, even more of a motivator for me just to keep pushing. Yeah, it, it does, you know, um, but again, you know, the bike is the is the accessory. The motivation has to come from within yourself in order to keep pushing. Um, the bike is susceptible to to failure as much as the human body. So it's a combination of of the two: the the drive from the bike and the drive from the the person to get you across the finish line on that day, or to get you as far as you can physically go. Uh, and that's what I. That's what I love about that that side of, of of cycling. And at the end of the day, it is cycling, much like BMX is. You know, it's uh, it's fun. It's got great people, and it's it's exciting. It's dynamic, and it's uh, it, it demands physicalities and mental strength from you, much like BMX does. How long are some of these events, or? Perhaps, what's the longest one? Um, the longest one, I think, is Unbound in Kansas. That's 207 miles. Um, I did that last year, which was very, very hard. And I just came from the Belgian Waffle Ride in California uh, last weekend, and that was 134 miles. So gravel races are anything from 50 miles to... Yeah, I mean the the unbound XL is I think three hundred and fifty miles. So okay. yeah, it's um wow. there are various lengths. Even within a race, you know, there's a ten mile, there's a thirty mile, there's a fifty, a seventy, a hundred. So whatever your goal is on that uh on that race weekend, you can sign up for for that distance and trying to achieve the, the goal that you're looking to achieve. Right. I don't know many of the American races. Are these loops? Do you end up back at base camp where you kick off or is it yeah, A to you're, B's? You always, you always end up back at the start finish. Okay. Um, but the, the terrain is, is very interesting. And yeah, it's not like a land's end to John O'Groats. It's, it is kind of a loop, but an unorthodox loop that can kind of cross over itself. It can be an out and back. It can, they just get, they get wild. I guess you'll learn a lot about yourself when you're out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess you, you do. do. You do. Yeah. I mean, some people go to see motivational speakers and pay thousands to sit in the audience. Some people go to a yoga camp a yoga retreat. Uh, they, they go to the far corners of the world to, to find themselves. And I pay an entry fee to go to a gravel race and I can find everything I need to find out about myself 
sitting there for 150 to 200 miles. What you go through in those miles and those hours on the bike requires a lot of mental stability. I can imagine. I can imagine, but I'm, I'm guessing you're pretty well conditioned because you're used to failure in the first place, so it's not. Well, it just puts everything else in life yeah. into context, doesn't it? Um, it? It really does. And you can apply, you know, the, the learnings from, from failure and overcoming challenges um, to anything in life. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jamie. We really appreciate You're your very time. You're welcome, guys. We really yeah, appreciate I your love time. The white bike behind you with the uh, old school drop bars. That's uh, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Thank you. That, that was our first show bike from right. way back in the day from launching the a first product. Speed. A single speed. Yeah, it's speed fi- bike. fixed. Fixed. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, it's, it, it's got a dubious honor of perhaps uh, I've spent a long day in a saddle on that. I did 160 miles on that over the South Downs. Man, wow. you, uh, wow. you're a stronger wow. man than I am. I've, no, no, no. <laughs> Far from it. I don't, I don't particularly park myself on fixie bikes, um, but, you know, I have ridden them in the past, but uh, over 160 miles, that's really not for me. Well, it's one of these days <laughs> that unfolded in a slightly unusual way. I didn't leave the front the front door expecting to do that distance on it, but that's the way it played out. Yeah. Some days you wake up and you ride six miles, and other days you get yeah. up and ride 160. Yeah, yeah indeed. But yeah. It's, it's great to um, just hear the whole um, backstory of where you've come from and where you are. And as I say, I can relate to some of the early the early years. In fact, um, one, of, one of our products, the Endo, was named after, yeah, one of the most <laughs> basic tricks that um, any teenage boy would kick off with. So yeah. that, that name came perhaps before the product was fully formulated. Yeah. Yeah, the Endo is uh, an entry-level trick, so to speak. Exactly. Um, or... All you need is a front brake or a curb, Indeed. and uh, that's that's how it all starts. Indeed, yeah, going from two wheels to one. Yes, sir. Is there? Do you want to tell them where they can find your coffee, Jamie, and maybe your social feeds? We'll have it on the screen anyway. But uh, yeah, uh, at Jamie Bestwick on. Uh, Instagram and Jamie Vestwick official on Facebook. And then, uh, you know, my coffee company is called Roth Rock Coffee. Um, we're out of Pennsylvania. And, Andrew, you tried yeah. it, right? I did. It's very nice. You, you, we was lucky enough for Jamie. For Jamie was kind enough to send us some really oh, good coffee. Yeah, I'll, uh, yeah, being back in England, it's a little easier to, uh, to send stuff over. But the way that the world is now with, with uh, the ease of shipping, you know, international shipping is, is somewhat of a breeze. Yeah. Yeah, well, so, thank you. Thank you yeah, so much, no, Jamie. Thank you for you guys. Glad to uh, glad to be on the first ever Cyclock podcast. We are super honored uh, to have you. Are you are you in your bike room Jamie. right now? No, I'm not in my bike room right now. Um, I'm going to ask for a little sneak peek of the, the pain case set up. <laughs> the pain case set up. Yeah, no, that's um, that's uh, that's about five miles away from here. Um, I just came into. We're, we're sponsoring a a local race that is nice. set up by uh, a women's cycling group, and they're in the second year of putting the event on, and they do such a great job uh, for the cycling community around here, and we help sponsor the event. Uh, with coffee and finances and I'm just all about supporting the local cycling. Community. That's amazing. Um, it, that's amazing. It means a lot to me and, you know, it, it's always giving back to a sport that's, that I love and has, has given me so much. 
That's amazing. If if we can um offer up some chuck some of our products and as the prizes, that would be amazing too. We'd love to support our local that events would, like that. They're amazing. That would be great. That would be absolutely awesome. And uh, I'm Done. sure, you know, the the people that um that will be at the race would would, would definitely be grateful. Um and also it would stop asking people you know, when the people come to my house, especially the uh, Happy Valley, you know, the Happy Valley Cycling Girls, they're like, "How do you hang those bikes on the wall?" And I go, "Okay, <laughs> let me show you. Let me show you." Pretty simple. Yeah. Well, we'd love yeah. to get involved. I'll. Well, well, we'll we'll speak about it anyway, and we can get that all sorted out. So we have a US warehouse, so it's a pretty simple process. Awesome. That would be amazing. Thank you, guys. Thank you so You're much. Welcome. I thank you ever so much, Jimmy. It's been a joy. Yep, a pleasure. All right, guys, enjoy your week, and uh, we'll see you soon. Will do. Bye-bye.